The search for genes which give rise to Parkinson's disease has been very fruitful over the last uh, decade or so. This kindred that we first came across, we were able to trace back to the fens, part of the eastern part of England, shown here with the box on the over the wash, showed a family with autosomal dominant history of Parkinsonism. We were able to examine some brain tissue from one of the affected members, and these clearly showed that this patient had classical pathological features of Parkinson's disease. In addition, we were able to use PET scanning technology to improve the pickup rate of subclinically affected individuals, which allowed us to pursue linkage uh, and ultimately gene identification using this kindred and others stop. In collaboration with colleagues in the United States and Spain, other families were found and we were able to identify the mutation in the gene that is known as LARC2. Since that time, a number of mutations have been found. These are shown here on this slide. It's noteworthy that there appears to be some clustering around the more active portions of the protein, in particular the ROC core and kinase domains. To date, to my knowledge, there are no mutations proven to cause Parkinson's disease elsewhere. The figures in blue are this fact has been reported in Asian populations. So one thing we can say quite early on following the finding of this gene is that from a numerical point of view, this is the most important autosomal dominant gene causing PD. However, work from our own group and others a few years ago identified what is now called the common mutation. This is called G2019S for short, and the, some of the data are summarized here. We were able to show that this single base pair mutation accounts for somewhere between one and a half to two percent of so-called sporadic disease. That is a case of Parkinson's disease coming through the clinic door with no obvious family history or no known family history who has this one base pair change stop. The find is becoming more interesting when one looks at certain populations and groups from France and New York were able to show that in certain populations such as the North African Arabs or the Ashkenazi Jewish populations, this mutation accounts for a very significant proportion of Parkinson's disease. It therefore became very important to work out what the penetrance of this mutation was, what the proportion of cases that might manifest this disease if you carry this mutation. This is important for us to be able to guide patients and their families who happen to carry this mutation. Shown here is a penetrance curve that was constructed following collaboration involving all the labs at the time who had published and examined this mutation in their cases. We ended up having data in over 18,000 PD patients who had been screened, which allowed us to draw this curve. This mutation has now entered clinical practice and is widely available across the world. So that summarises very quickly what's happened in the genetic understanding of LARC2 in the last few years. LARC2 has become even more interesting when one starts to consider population genetic approaches and the so-called common variety of Parkinson's disease. And this is, involves data amassed from a large number of genome-wide association studies. Summarised on this slide is the results of a meta-analysis undertaken by combining a number of already large-scale studies into a huge meta-analysis. So using these published studies, we were able to perform a detailed analysis of over 5,000 cases and 12,000 controls. Using 1,000 genome data, we managed to impute polymorphisms of up to 7 million per sample. We performed genome-wide association, and we were able to replicate those findings in a 7,000 cases and 9,000 controls. So this is a very large study. And this is summarized on this slide where we were able to show that common variation around the LARC2 gene also contributed to Parkinson's disease risk. So we have two ways of thinking about LARC2 genetics. Firstly, we have Mendelian mutations, which I described earlier, but now we have the fact that on common variation, LARC2 also stands out from the crowd. We've been able to fine map the polymorphism contributing to disease risk 
and this therefore enables us to start to ask questions about what this means at a genomic and ultimately proteomic and functional level. This summarizes some unpublished work that shows that LARC2 is not expressed uniformly in equal amounts across the brain. It's expressed more robustly in the occipital cortex more than the cerebellum or the white matter. Perhaps more interesting from a functional biology point of view is that we have now clear evidence that exons 31, 32 and 42 are spliced out predominantly in most of the isoforms found in the substantia nigra. These exons encode the core kinase domains and therefore it does support the view that there's some functional effect of these splicing events which may in turn illuminate how we think about the biology of LARC2 in Parkinson's disease. LARC2 isn't just of interest to people with Parkinson's disease, it's also been robustly shown up in inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease. Rather paradoxically, and we do not have a clear answer to these data yet, shown here is the fact that the putatively associated SNP that we find mapped is have an impact on the expression in the brain of LARC2. But that association is found with the SNP, the polymorphism associated with Crohn's disease, rather than Parkinson's disease. In contrast, we have the polymorphism found in Parkinson's disease, which shows a correlation in monocytes. This should make us stop and think a little about the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, let alone thinking about that for Crohn's disease. And it raises a number of important questions. Clearly, we want, need to think about where there's a common pathway for LARC2 in, in Parkinson's disease. Is the pathway the same for Mendelian Parkinson's disease as it is for this common variation? We don't know the answer to that yet. Is it in some way implicated in kinase activity? There's some data supporting that for the Mendelian mutations, but we have no data yet in the common variation variants. What about the role in microtubule aggregation, the recent data emerging from this? The correlation of the associated polymorphism with monocyte expression raises the possibility, of course, that LARC2 may be implicating the immune system in Parkinson's disease. The immune system has been implicated before in Parkinson's disease, but this may be the first genetic data pointing in that direction. It also should guide us as how we think about which cell models or animal models to construct. If it's true that splicing in or out of certain exons needs to be taken in, into account in the pathophysiology, then we need to know which exons are the ones to be omitted or included in our various models. And this will guide us on what functional biology to pursue in the future.